I have a feeling that many of you grew up in a family very similar to mine uh, that was very uh, competitive, and especially when family got together for holidays or things like that, we would play games. Any, let's, let's just do a little uh, interactive here. I want, I want to get some participation from you. So if you were and you grew up in a family that likes to play games whenever you get together, I just want a little round of applause. Okay, okay. Now, in one particular game, uh, usually came around with our family, and because we were all very competitive, it usually caused a lot of strife, a little bit more than most other games would do, and that was the lovely game of Monopoly. Anybody ever played Monopoly growing up? Okay. How many of you, by, by, keep, we'll keep clapping, we'll keep that going. How many of you love, like you really enjoy playing the, go- the game of Monopoly? Okay. So y'all know what's coming. How many of you hate playing the game of Monopoly, right? Okay. So Monopoly has this awesome ability to like rip relationships and families apart. I mean, growing up, we had, uh, we, have, we have cousins that still haven't talked to each other from a Monopoly game from 1982. I mean, it's just, it's one of those games that, that causes so much tension. But I, I love the game of Monopoly. Now, here's why I love the game of Monopoly, because the game of Monopoly lets you, it affords you the opportunity to wheel and deal and take advantage of people, right? Like, like how many of you like to take, I'm just kidding, don't, don't applaud that. So Monopoly is this weird game, and uh, the whole point of the game is to create a Monopoly. And as I was growing up, I learned really easy that you could, you could say anything, that, like, the, the rules are there, but you could say anything you want, like Game Monopoly. Like, I would offer these awesome deals. I was one of those people. Uh, actually, let's start this. So some of you have a favorite piece, right? Like you, you played Monopoly, and you always wanted to be the top hat. Anybody want to be the top hat? Okay, we got a couple top hats. Anybody want to be like me, always want to be the race car? Yeah, there we go. Okay, now, now you have to admit this, because I know there's some weird people out here who wanted to be the iron. How many of you wanted to be the iron? Come on. Admit it. Okay, we got a couple brave souls who admit they wanted to be the iron, right? But it was one of those games that, like, you always had certain things you went for. I was one of those people. I was a red, yellow, green guy, right? Like, those of you who know the Monopoly board, you kind of start around the corner. Uh, Every side has a railroad, um, but you start kind of with the cheap side, and you eventually get into the expensive stuff. But that red, yellow, green section, man, if you could get a control of that red, yellow, man, you could just rule the world, right? So I would do anything and everything I could to get those pieces. Like, I would sit there, and I have, like, railroads, and I'd be like, all right, I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. I'll give you two railroads, $1,000 in cash, Monopoly cash, right? $1,000 in cash, my first unborn child, and my second mortgage and my house in Rio in 20 years. I'll give you all of that for North Carolina Avenue. And people will be like, well, yeah, I'll take that deal. And then all of a sudden, I got all the greens, and I start controlling the world as it comes to Monopoly. So I love the game. People who, lo- who played Monopoly with me, they didn't like it because I was always like, all of a sudden, I'd be sitting there and I was one of those lovely people, probably like some of you, who maybe three quarters of the way through the game, all of a sudden, you know, you've got your little Monopoly going, got a couple hotels. And especially if one of my sisters were to land on one of those pieces of the hotel, I would say, oh, this is awesome. Welcome to my five-star hotel. We are so glad to see you here today. We would like to make your stay as enjoyable as possible. So if you need any extra pillows or towels while you stay at our hotel, you just let us know. We are here to take care of you, and that will be $1,600 to stay at my hotel, right? And all of a sudden, like, you just get all this money. People are, like, going broke. They're, like, selling their property. Uh, They're giving blood to try to make some extra money to be able to stay at your hotel. And and so this game would go on, um, but then, in all the years that I've played Monopoly, I've played with a couple people, and I'm afraid, we may have to pray about this, but I'm afraid there may be some of you in this room, that on occasion, I would play the game of Monopoly, and there would be somebody who goes, hey, I'm going to go get a drink, would you like anything? I'm like, oh no, I'm good. And as they got up from the table, they would accidentally knock the, the board off, and everything would go everywhere, and all of a sudden, all the progress we made would be for naught, right? Okay, honestly, I want to know, how many of you have ever done that before? Oh, oh okay, we got one clap over. Okay, I'm just feeling better that, that, uh, that there's some of you in here. Here's the thing. 
in that moment, you reached a point in the game where it seemed like it would be better to start over. Oh, man, we don't know where we are. I guess we just have to start over with a new game. And sometimes in life, we get to that point in our life where we go, you know what? I'm done. I'm tired of always feeling like I'm behind the eight ball. I'm tired of always feeling like I can't catch back up. Instead of trying to keep making progress, I just want to start over. Now, I'm going to keep a little participation going. How many of you have ever felt in your life like you just wanted to start over? Well, see, this morning, we're going to talk about what it means to get that restart, to be able to be in that place in life where we feel like we can start over, start fresh. And a lot of times that happens with the new year. We are now in the, uh, the first week and a half of 2016. And we have an opportunity this morning, and some of you have already kind of made those decisions. You've kind of processed through what 2016 might look like for you. Maybe you took Ryan's um, challenge last week and you said, okay, here's going to be my one word for 2016. And here's what, what I feel like God is leading me to do. And many of you have already put that on social media. You've put that out. And remember, if you're going to do that, we just ask you that you hashtag uh, re2016 just so we can see and interact with you and be able to connect with you with the things that God is leading to you, that one word that you want, that God wants you to focus on in 2016. But there's some things about a restart that we have to be aware of. There's some things when we start over, some things that when we get into a new year, we go, okay, I'm going to restart, and today, from here on out, 2016 is going to be a brand new year. I'm so excited for it. There's some things that we have to be careful. In order to see that, we're going to turn to the book of uh, First Chronicles, uh, chapter 21. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and pull there. And as we do, we're going to point out some things uh, about uh, a restart that happened Uh, and some principles that we might be able to apply to our own lives uh, when it comes to this restart in 2016. So 1 Chronicles chapter 21, starting in verse 1. It's going to be up on the screen, but you can also pull it up uh, in in your Bible or on your phone. It says this, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Now, this statement is very, very important to the rest of the passage, okay? So I, I don't want us to miss what, what happens here. You see, it says, then Satan stood against Israel and David, and he incites David to number the people. Now, those of you who have paid attention to the Old Testament, sometimes it's really hard, but there have been a number of times where God uh, told one of the leaders to go number the people for good reasons, bad reasons, to, uh, to build them up, to, to uh, narrow them down, whatever the case may be, there's a number of times in the Old Testament where God has told the commander, the leader, the king, to number the people. But you have to pay attention and make sure that you see what actually happened. It says Satan stood against David. Satan stood against the nation of Israel, and he told David. He incited David to go number the people. And so from the very beginning of this passage in 1 Chronicles 21, we understand that David's about to do some actions that could be positive and could be things that God has asked him to do in the past, but was not asked by God to do those things. Look what it goes on and says, verse 2. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab, he pays attention, right? He's like, hey, this whole time we've been following after God, and when God tells us to do, to do something, we go and do it. But Joab says, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my Lord, the king, all of them the Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? But the king's word prevailed against Joab, so Joab departed and went throughout all Israel he came back to Jerusalem, and Joab gave the sum of the number, the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all Israel, there were one million one hundred thousand men who drew the sword, and in Judah, four hundred and seventy thousand who drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. So, so here's the thing: in this whole passage, we get this idea that that Joab's kind of like, okay, I'm kind of questioning this, but I'm not going to really question David. Like David's the king. So he kind of protests a little bit, but then he goes, but I'm going to do what my king tells me to do. So he goes and he counts. And I want you to think about this for a minute. How many of you like to really have to go and count a million people? Like to sit there and go, okay, here's our job. We got to count all these people. 
And so he does, I, you don't know how long this takes. We don't know if it was like a real quick thing, like in a day, or if it takes a couple of weeks. And Job the whole time is kind of like, okay, man, you know, this is a little bit different. I feel a little different about this. There's something that's not right about what's about to happen. And so he goes and he counts them all. He brings them all back to David. And look what it says in verse 7. But God was displeased with this thing, and he struck Israel. Verse 8, and David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. We get this idea that this is something that wasn't an evil thing. It wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't something uh, that David did out of the selfishness of his heart that he goes and he does this thing because it was something that God had commanded them many times before to do. That, hey, I want you to go number the people. But God didn't tell him to do it. Satan. So it says in verse 7 that God was displeased. He struck Israel. Something that seems as mundane and as trivial as numbering the people, they go out and do it, and now God is displeased with the people because they did something that they've done hundreds of times before in the name of the Lord. And it was all because it was not God's idea. And so the question that we want to kind of think through this morning as we process what this restart might look like for you. You sit there and go, man, 2015 was rough. I, I want a new year. I want a new me in 2016. I'm, I'm going to lose weight. Uh, I'm going to get fit. Uh, I'm going to get financially stable. I'm going to do all of these things. And, and the question that we have to kind of address in this idea is, is this restart your ambition or is it God's burden? Very simply put, whose idea is this? You see, in, in First Chronicles, we get this idea that they're doing this thing that can offer value to the people of God and to God. And you may right now be sitting there going, man, I, I want to uh, go, go work for the homeless. I want, I want to go serve the homeless. I want uh, to go serve my time. I, I want to go do this and this and this and this and this. And here's the thing. If God hasn't called you to do that, that is your ambition. And the question for your restart this year is we get into the throes of 2016. Is this your ambition or is it God's burden? You see, uh, in, in Scripture, uh, sometimes when we look at words and we sit there and we say, okay, um, you know, ambition, you know, sometimes that can be a really good thing, right? Uh, I'm reading a book that my dad gave me for Christmas. Uh, it's called uh, Unlocking Your Ambition. Uh, and so it's this, this idea, it's like, hey, you know, hey, how do you take the steps necessary to achieve your dreams and your goals? Uh, and it's this really awesome book written by a, a, a mentor coach of his. And so getting into it. Um, but, but you have to pay attention to this idea that ambition is one of those things um, that can sometimes lead you to selfishness, to pride, to following after your own dreams and not the things that God has called you to. In Scripture, ambition is almost always used as a negative term. Now, we sit there and we think ambition, like you want to be ambitious in your, in your workforce, you want to go and, and be a hard worker, you want to be ambitious in your family, you always want to be uh, connected and involved and all those kind of things. We use ambition as a, a positive word, but in Scripture, it's almost always used as a negative because it's almost always associated with us doing something we want to do rather than what God wants to do. On the flip side, burden is almost always used as a positive, where we look at that the opposite way, right? Like we sit there and go, man, I'm just so burdened uh, by work and my boss and, and all the things that I've got to process. I'm burdened by uh, the, the relationships that I have in my family that aren't where I think they need to be, and we feel uh, heavy and we feel stressed. But if you remember what Jesus said, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because God's burden is always used as a good thing. Because it's his idea, not ours. And I sit there and go, I want to live a life that's constantly following after what God has in store for me and not what I have in store for me. Because I've done the things that I thought I had in store for me, and those things don't end well, right? Many of you could probably relate to times in your life where you sit there and go, yeah, I knew that I was chasing after my own dreams and not the dreams that God had placed before me. And so when we talk about a restart, we've got to start with that idea. Sometimes we even have to start with that idea when we talk about our one word. Some of you have said, yeah, my one word is going to be um, financial stability. And then when you threw away your lottery ticket last night, you go, well, there went that word, right? 
Like we, we want something and we, we have this ambition that we want for our lives. We want people to see that we're successful. We want people to see that we're happy in our relationships. But here's the thing. If your one word that you have for 2016 is given by God, then it's not up to you to see things happen through it. Now, hear me when I say that. When, when, when it's our idea and we say, okay, this is what I want for my life in 2016. This is the word that I think I should have for 2016. Now, the pressure is all on us to fulfill that one word. But if it's God's word for your life, if it's the, the, the word that God has spoken into your life, you almost can't help but see those things fulfilled in your life. All of a sudden, you start going, okay, I'm going to chase after this because I don't really understand this. And this doesn't really make me comfortable, but I'm going to search after this because I feel like it's what God has in store for me. And now, all of a sudden, doors start opening that you never thought possible. Now, all of a sudden, you start being in situations where you're like, how in the world did this happen? And many of you gave us testimony in over 2015 of things that happened in your life based off this one word you were focusing. I, I feel like God is just wanting me to focus on this. And now all of a sudden, when we start talking about in Scripture, it says let the heavens open. And we start talking about let the floodgates come down from heaven. All of a sudden, you can't keep God from moving in your life because you're focused on his burden and not your ambition. Sometimes that's hard for us, right? Like sometimes it's hard for us to trust because we go, well, this makes a lot, this ambition in my life makes a lot of sense. What God is kind of leading me to, that doesn't, like, I, I don't get what he wants for me in that. My word for 2016, um, been kind of processing it for a couple of weeks and uh, knew I was going to have the opportunity to preach today. And so I wanted to, uh, to be able to share that with you. My, um, my, my word that I feel like God is leading me to in 2016 is the word dream. Um, and last, last year, I really felt like God was leading me towards um, influence. And I was like, okay, God, that makes sense to me. Like, I, I, I understand that because that's something that I, I can look around and I can say, hey, who do, I have, who do I have influence over? Who can I influence with the name of Jesus? So I go, hey, I'm a student pastor. Man, I got hundreds of kids at my disposal. Look at all this influence I can have uh, on them. And then I sit there and go, look at the, the group of friends that I have surrounding me. And now I have the opportunity uh, to, to influence them with uh, the love and the compassion and the mercy of Jesus. And I'm like, okay, God, this makes sense. And God worked some amazing things uh, through that word for me in 2015. But in 2016, I kept getting this picture in my mind. Like, what would you do if? Like, this question kept coming up. What would you do if money was no object? Like, how would that change the way that I lived my life for the gospel? What would you do if... Um, the, the committees and, and the, the structure and the red tape that you have to go through in order to have something happen, what if that wasn't there? Would it change the way you did things? What if all of a sudden this, this sense of doubt whenever it comes to, okay, I really feel like God's leading me to do this, but if I do this, then this person's going to say no, this person's going to give me pushback, and this person's just going to get mad. What if that wasn't there? And this idea of dreaming came up. And the Old Testament talks a lot about um, how uh, young men will dream dreams, and, uh, and we get this idea that, like, what if? So I felt like God was calling me to that. And already in 2016, I've already seen some ways in which God has opened some doors to things that I never really thought possible. And I was just like, oh, that, that's not really, like, like that's, that's like a, a, a fantasy that could happen. And God is already putting in place the opportunity for things to happen I never thought would. Because I began to go, okay, what are the things that I want? What are the things that God is calling to me? Is my restart in 2016 my own ambition? Or is it God's burden? So as, as I'm processing through this idea of a restart and I'm processing through what it means for, for us, I, I want to give us some, some tangible things that we can process in this restart. Like sometimes it's easy to go, yeah, I absolutely want to restart. I know what 2015 was for me. I want to start something new in 2016. I want to be something that God wants me to be in 2016. I want God's burden, not my own ambition. So Michael, tell me how to do that. So this morning, I want to tell you how to do that. And I want to use one of my favorite movies of all time. And guys, uh, some of you in this crowd are really going to love this. Some of you in this, in this room um, are going to go, oh my gosh, Michael, I knew there was something wrong with you. Uh, but here's the thing, one of my favorite movies of all time 
is the movie It's a Wonderful Life, right? It's a Wonderful Life is one of those movies that uh, transcends time because while the, the cinematic uh, properties of the movie could obviously be done in a completely different way in 2016, there are some things that you cannot take away from a movie uh, that was made in black and white, that was made uh, on a, a TV studio that had so many limitations to it. But there's one particular part in the movie that just jumped out to me uh, a couple weeks ago, and I said, man, I've got to share this with you guys. I have got to share the things that God, I mean, spoke to me very vividly through this movie. And, and you may think it's kind of silly, but, but it's one of those things that I go, man, I can't deny what God spoke to me uh, through this clip. So to set it up, uh, those of you who've never seen the movie, um, it's, it's about a guy named George Bailey. And George Bailey lives uh, in a small community. His whole family, his family's lived there their whole life. And through a series of unfortunate events, George Bailey has had to stay. He had dreams. He had ambitions to go out and do all these great and mighty things. But through a series of events, he's got to stay um, in town. He's got to stay in Bedford Falls. And he's got he's to do all these different things to where he basically can't have the things that he's always dreamed for. So he gets to a point in this, this crucible of life, this very difficult time in his life, this crossroads where he says, you know what, it'd be better if I just wasn't born. So God sends an angel by the name of Clarence, to uh, interact with George Bailey. And through that interaction, he says, okay, you can have your wish. You've never been born. And George Bailey gets the opportunity to see what it would be like if he never existed. All the ways that he had impacted people's lives, all the ways that he made a difference in their lives, and all of that was gone because he'd never been born. So he's, he's interacting with people he's known all his life, but they don't know him. And, and it's just this, like, scary a uh, ridiculous time of fear that George Bailey has to process. And so the clip you're going to see is this, this moment in George Bailey's life where he says, I can't handle it anymore. I just want to go back to the way things. I want a restart with my old life. I don't want uh, to never be born. I, I love my life, but I want a restart of what I had. And so there's a couple things that I want you to, to, to be aware of while you watch this clip. First one, watch when it starts to snow. Very important. Secondly, George Bailey makes three comments. Three comments that I think help us understand what it means to restart. You guys check this out. Clarence! Clarence! Help me, Clarence! Get me back! Get me back, I don't care what happens to me. Get me back to my wife and kids. Help me, Clarence, please. Please. I want to live again. I want to live again. I want to live again. Please, God, let me live again. Hey, George! George! You all right? Hey, what's the matter? Now get out of here, Bert, or I'll hit you again. Get out of here. What the Sam Hill are you yelling for, George? You... George? Bert, do you know me? Know you? <laughs> you kidding? I've been looking all over town trying to find you. I saw your car piled into that tree down there, and I thought maybe you... Hey, your mouth's bleeding. Are you sure you're all right? What you... Bert! My mouth's bleed! Zuzu pedals! Zuzu! There they are! Bert! What do you know about that? Merry Christmas! Well, Merry Christmas! So, so here's the thing, right? George Bailey makes three statements that I think transcend a movie uh, that, that to, our gener to my generation and younger sometimes doesn't have application. There's three statements that I think uh, speak to us today. The first thing that he says after he addresses God and says, God, I don't want my ambition anymore. God, I want what you want. And he cries out to God, it begins to snow. It's not his idea anymore, it's all God's. He makes this first statement. He says, Bert, you know me, right? Because this whole time he's been like, nobody knows who he is. And so he's like, oh, this realization, Bert, you know me. And I want you to hear something very clearly this morning. God 
knows you. In this restart, God knows you. Look what it says in Jeremiah. It says, Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. He says later in Jeremiah that he not only knows you, Jeremiah 29.11, but he also has a plan for your life. He has a hope. He has a future for you. He says in Isaiah, but now says the Lord, he has created you, he formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. These are God's word to you in 2016. John chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. It says that you, as a sheep, know the voice of of your shepherd. In 2003, I had the opportunity to go to Morocco and spend uh, a summer there, and it's very uh, rural areas, very uh, first century in the way that they do things. They still have shepherds who walk through uh, the mountains with their uh, sheep, and it was really cool to see how all of these different um, flocks would be together in one field, and there'd be like five or six shepherds kind of standing at the edge talking, and then all of a sudden, one of them would whistle, they like, like, have this like unique whistle, and they like whistle and start to walk off, and all of a sudden, these like 20, 30 sheep would just start following. Why? Because the sheep knew the voice of the shepherd. And so in this, what God is saying to you here and now is he knows you, and he wants you to know him in 2016, to be able to follow after the things that he set before you. That they're not just your own selfish ambitions, they're not just your own selfish ideas, but you're following after the things that the shepherd is leading you to. But see, that's, not the, that's the first statement he says, Bert, you know me. The second thing, and I love the progression of emotion that happens in George Bay. Like the first rule is, say, okay, hey, you know me. Like there's this like, hold on a second. And then he says, Bert, your, your mouth's bleeding. And he starts freaking out, right? He's like, oh my gosh, my mouth's bleeding, right? He's so happy that his mouth is bleeding because it means he's back. He's back into his old life, and his mouth bleeding reminds him that life is painful. And some of you go, yeah, I, I understand that. Like 2015 was difficult. It was painful. It was hurting me. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, I have said these things to you, that in you you may have peace. In the world you will have suffering. You will have tribulation. You will have pain. If you look through the New Testament, almost every book in the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, talks about the fact that we as believers, following after God's burden in our life, will have pain. There will be difficult days. Life is painful. But look what he says at the end of 16, John 16, 33. But have heart, for I have overcome the world. To take hope, because I've already conquered the pain. I've already conquered the death. I've already conquered anything that you could face. So have hope. Know that there's going to be pain. Know it's going to be difficult. Know that things are going to hurt. But be hopeful, because I've already taken care of it. The shepherd who knows you has already taken care of that pain. He says in Romans 8, 18, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us someday when we spend eternity with the Savior. The current sufferings that we're having to walk through, whether that's uh, physical pain, whether that's emotional pain, whether that's relationship pain, the physical things that we have to deal with on this life, the pain we have to deal with now, do not compare to the glory that we will reside in for all eternity with Jesus. And then he makes this last statement. And this is the statement that gets me every time, because those of you who know the movie, you understand the depth of what he says. He reaches in his pockets, and he goes, Zuzu's pedals, right? Zuzu's pedals. And he free pulls them out, and I'm sure Bert's just like, dude, you've lost it, right? But he pulls out these pedals, and he realizes for the very first time, that he has to celebrate the little things. 
You've got to celebrate the little things. Because sometimes in life we get very discouraged because we're like, man, God's not doing the things like he's doing uh, to these, these missionaries that we see in Africa. And they're telling all these great stories. And, and all these people go off and they do these things. Or, or you know, people who uh, are always investing in stuff and they're, and they're doing things. And God's moving their lives. And, and I just want God to move in their life like he moves, you know, move in my life like he moves in their life. And here's the thing. George Bailey in this moment realizes that it's not about the money that he owes to the bank. It's not about the fact that he's about to be arrested and thrown in jail. It's not about any of those things. He realizes the fact that his little daughter gave him some petals. And he made, as her flower was hurt, and he made those petals disappear. And he pulled out this beautiful flower and gave it to her because it made her day. That that relationship meant more to him in that moment than any of the big stuff. He had big dreams about going to Europe and about going to Africa and traveling and doing all this great and mighty stuff. And in that moment, he realized, I appreciate the little things. Why? Because for a moment in his life, the little things were gone. He never realized how much he meant. And this is my encouragement for you as we get started in this restart of 2016. As, as we get into this, George Bailey has a chance to restart his life. Remember, he didn't get a new life, right? He still has his old life, but in this, he now has a new perspective on this new year. And he loves it. Why? Because he realized people knew him. And you need to realize that God knows you. He realized that there's going to be pain in life. And you need to realize that life is not without pain. There's hope. There's always going to be pain. But you've got to find a way to celebrate the little things. To go, what are the things that God has me in right now that I may see as trivial? That I may see as something that's so small that, man, why, why would I celebrate that? But if it was gone, how much would you miss it? How much would you miss that friendship that, you know, y'all don't talk about the deep, you know, uh, theological things and aspects of God. But if that person was gone, you would miss that relationship that you may see as trivial. What are the things that you need to celebrate in 2016? So here's the questions for you this morning. 2016 offers you the opportunity to get a restart. Are you going to take advantage of that? And if you do, process this question. Is it your ambition or is it God's burden? Is it your idea or is it God's idea? Because if it's God's idea, you hold on to a couple truths. He knows you. He knows everything about you. And he wants you to follow after him. He knows life is going to be painful, but he's going to be there with you through the entire time. And he wants to show you the little things so that you can get up every day and say to God, be the glory. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for a 2016. We thank you for a new year. We thank you for an opportunity to be in this place to worship your name. And God, I thank you for 2016 that as we um, get this restart in life, God, I thank you that, that we have uh, an opportunity to, uh, to chase after some things that you've set before us. But God, we first have to wrestle with this idea. We have to wrestle with the notion that we've got to figure out, is it your idea or is it ours? So God, I just pray for those in this room this morning as uh, we reflect on what we've heard, as we reflect on what it means to restart in 2016. That God, you'll help us chase after your visions for our lives. You'll help us chase after your dreams that you've set before us. God, that you'll give us, maybe some people in this word have been still processing what that one word for 2016 might be. That God, you will this morning speak into their hearts a word. You'll speak into their lives a word that represents who you are and who you want to be in their life in 2016. God, I pray that as we do that, you help comfort us. That you, through your spirit, comforts us with this idea that you are here for us no matter what. And that God, in in that, we know that sometimes chasing after your burden, sometimes being a part of your plan and your vision for our life is painful. God, help us see the little things around us and celebrate those things so that we can then in turn honor you in our lives in 2016.